500. On the front row with a new qualifying record of 212.809 in the Coors Belling Ford, Bill Elliott, number nine. Outside of row number one will be the Miller American Buick, number 22, driven by Bobby Allison from nearby Hueytown, Alabama. His son will start inside second row, Davey Allison in the number 28 Haviland Ford. You need only look at the grandstands and the infield to get an idea of how important this race is. The attendance here, probably over 100,000, and each of them are now on their feet, ready for the start of this 188-lap, 500-mile Winston 500 from the world's longest and fastest racetrack, Talladega, Alabama. They come through the trioval. The pace car pulls off. The crowd now begins to cheer as Bill Elliott and Bobby Allison come down through the 18 degrees of banking in the trioval, looking for the green flag that will start this event. Let's watch him. If everything looks good, the green flag will go out. There it is, the acceleration. The pace picks up, and the Winston 500 is underway. On a Sunday evening in Talladega, Alabama, the Winston 500 is being played out. It is Davey Allison leading Bill Elliott. The interval about four seconds. Bill Elliott is, is low on the racetrack and may be finished. The Ford drops low. Has nothing to do with fuel. Long ways away from the pit stop. Bill Elliott, is he breaking? It looks like curtains for Elliott. Well, Bill Elliott's getting pushed behind the pit wall. We'll try to get a quick comment with Bill if we can as he's still in the car. Going along the side here in the course Ford. Well, we're here with him. Bill, what happened out there to the car, Bill? I don't really know. It might have dropped a mile. Looks like you really had a good shot at it. Uh, might have might have been you and Davey Allison as, as the two strongest cars in the field. I don't feel like I got to beat Davey. Davey was running too good. Is there anybody that can handle him at all now? Oh, not a soul. <laughs> well, that sums it up right there. It looks it's like sure it's going to be Davey's afternoon. Bill, well, Bill Elliott's getting pushed behind the pit wall. We'll try to get a quick comment with Bill if we can as he's still in the car. Going along the side here in the course for it. Well, we're here with him. Bill, what happened out there to the car, Bill? I don't really know. It might get dropped a mile. Looks like you really had a good shot at it. Uh, might have might have been you and Davey Allison as, as the two strongest cars in the field. I don't feel like I got to beat Davey. Davey was running too good. Is there anybody that can handle him at all now? Oh, not a soul. <laughs> well, that sums it up right there. It, it looks sure like it's going to be Davey's afternoon. Bill Elliott. Uh, half a lap to go. Let's watch and see if Davey Allison can win the Winston 500. He's in turns three and four. He's on to the trioval, a short straightaway, connecting turn four and the dog leg here in front of the grandstand. He's a few feet away from the checkered flag. There it is, Davey Allison wins! Terry Labonte finishes second. The sweetest victories are the first time winners. What is it about Talladega that produces these first time winners? Uh, Mark Martin is telling his crew that he's going to try to push Terry Labonte out in front. And where he goes, Mark Martin is going to go. Oh, man. <laughs> well, Terry Labonte has been in the thick of several last lap finishes here at Talladega, has not been victor in either one of them, but he's been in the middle of several of those races right down to the wire. And he'd certainly like to come out in front. They, we talked about hand signals at the beginning or during the show we talked about hand signals. If Labonte could just talk to Mark Martin person to person for five seconds right now, they could win the race. But I don't know if they can figure it out using their hands through the rear window and the windshield. If Terry Labonte, a number 11, can win this race, it'll give Junior Johnson his first super speedway win since Neil Bonnet did it at Rockingham in 1986. Right now, as Rusty Wallace is right there, but it is do or die time for these first three cars. They cross the stripe and get the white flag. There is one more lap to go. Now what has to happen here is that Terry Labonte has to pull out and Mark Martin go with them. They got to build up some momentum together if they have any shot of moving around Davey Allison. They might not even be able to build up that much momentum. Down the backstretch for the final time. Terry Labonte is looking, looking right, looking left. Can't find the opportunity he needs. 
Davey Allison is right there in the middle of the racetrack. Let's see what Terry Labonte can do, if anything, and what Mark Martin can do. It could be that they'll just have to stay in line and finish this way. Here they come into the tri-oval. The slow car will help. The slow car will help Davey Allison. Move let's, over, Davey. Get some air. Let's watch. It's Davey Allison coming to the strike. Terry Labonte right behind him. I don't think he's going to do it. No, Davey Allison wins the Winston 500 with Terry Labonte second. Flag, one lap to go. He's going to get a shot, Eddie. Kyle Petty is there. He is just a car length back of Earnhardt. Davey Allison coming up, but I don't think Look will be a factor. Marco. Kyle just hauls it off the corner. He's got the inside. You what. He's up to Earnhardt's oh. bumper. Earnhardt oh, takes dirt. it. They're on the, they're on the racing service down on the uh -oh. left part of the racetrack. Look and out. Oh, oh, no. so here it is. And it's Kyle Petty. Kyle Petty coming to the checkered flag. Here comes Davey Allison to the bottom. It'll be the finish. Everybody oh, was no. waiting for it. Oh, they we crashed finished. past the finish line. Uh -oh. They have crashed into turn number one. And Davey Allison is in a shower of sparks. He won the race, but he sure paid the price for it. What a finish, Mike, I'm telling you. The lead swapped three times on in the last quarter mile of the racetrack. Unbelievable. Uh-oh. Unbelievable. <laughs> Talk about one hot night. Oh, we got to look at this again. <laughs> and we'll be back to do it. Right after these messages. Did this live up to its billing or what? Wow. Don't leave. Through his entire life, Davey Allison successfully handled the challenges and dangers that encompass stock car racing. There it is! Davey Allison wins! Davey Allison now moves the pole! Mark Martin and Allison grabs the lead! Here comes Mark Martin trying to make a move off of corner number four. It's a drag race. Wow. I don't know. A I don't photo know. finish. I think Davey Allison won, but I wouldn't say for sure. It is ironic that his life would not end on a racetrack, but in an accident while flying a helicopter. What follows is the story of a racing superstar snatched away from all of us in his prime. A story told by his friends, family, and Davey himself. To ever meet a finer human being in any kind of lifestyle. The determination, the way he accepted the losses and the mishaps. Even when things was down and rough, he never got down. Davey's a very sensitive person, and he had one of the biggest hearts that, that you could ever imagine. He was really level-headed about what was going on in the sport, what stardom did to him. He did all the right things a superstar should do. We really lived out a dream and I, I'm real fortunate. Davey felt real fortunate to be able to do exactly what he wanted to do. Never wanted to do anything else. As far back as I can remember, I, my mom tells a story. It's not really a story, it's true. But I used to get kept after school when I was at St. Aloysius Elementary School for drawing pictures of what I wanted my race car to look like while I should be doing my school work. And uh, my teachers would keep me after school and make me do my classwork, and then they'd bring me home. And my mom tells everybody that she told one of the, the teachers that if she wanted me to count apples, turn those apples into race cars, and I could count them. With an ordinary dad, the only difference was my dad's name showed up in the newspaper sometimes, and he was on TV every once in a while, and you know I heard his name on the radio occasionally. But other than that. You know, to me it was no different until after I was grown up and I realized, you know, there is something different here. He was a really fun child for me, you know. Uh, I have said a lot of times that a lot of fathers would like to be able to have a child like Davey, you know, a son like Davey, because from early on he was really focused. You know, he talked about going racing from way, way early age, you know, and um, 
he raced the, the tricycles and the bicycles and the wagons and those kind of things uh, as he got on up. But then one day he got to the point where it was time to quit talking about racing and start working toward it, and he did that. He was born with the Allison name to Bobby and Judy in Hollywood, Florida on the eve of his father's first Daytona 500. David Carl Allison was born with racing in his blood, but his ascent to Winston Cup stardom was not as easy as one might have thought. For an Allison earned his way to the top by working hard and learning every step of the way. The only thing that was ever handed was opportunity. And Davey took 110% advantage of that opportunity. When, when Davey grew up on Crescent Drive in Hueytown, they, uh, it was wooded across the street. And uh, we had made a bicycle track out there. And uh, Davey had a purple bicycle that just was the talk of the town. And uh, he'd win every bicycle race we had out there. We had our own flag set. We made a flag stand. Somebody was always the flagman. Davey was always Bobby Allison, and everybody else got to choose who they were after that. He knew he was very proud of his father, which we all were. And uh, he grew up in a hurry and, and learned how to uh, learn a lot from his father. I'm sure he told him all the inside tips, but uh, at the same time, it wasn't handed to him. He, he worked for it, and uh, so that his father knew that if you do it the hard way, you'll remember how you got there. Well, my dad taught me early on that, that uh, if you earned something, you did appreciate it better. And, you know, if you went ahead and worked for what you wanted instead of somebody uh, giving you the, uh, the opportunity or the, the equipment or part of it or anything, that really it was a better, um, better way to move into a, a situation that, that you want to be a long term situation. I, I never felt any pressure from being Bobby Allison's son. You know, I, I had a tremendous opportunity to work in his shop, to learn from him, and then he let me use his shop to work on my own race cars between the times that I was working on his, and really gave me a, a tremendous head start on this sport. I never let the name Bobby Allison have an impact on me as far as a negative or pressure, I let that be a plus. His fellow competitors, they weren't laughing long at this bunch, as Davey finished fifth in his first race on April 22nd, 1979 in Birmingham. He was driving a 1972 Chevy Nova that he had borrowed from his uncle Donnie. Five races later, he'd win as Father Bobby watched from the pits, and that caught the attention of the entire Alabama racing community, including an up-and-coming young crew chief. His name, Larry McReynolds. When Davey first come along, I really thought he was just Bobby Allison's son that was trying to be a race car driver, you know. I mean, he, he was peeling the fence down pretty regular at Birmingham, but the thing that I did admire about him was He'd peel that fence down, he'd go back to Hueytown and work night and day the next week and piece it back together and come back and, and give it his all again. And it's like finally all of a sudden, rather than peeling the fence down or going through the grandstands, all of a sudden, wow, Davey won, you know. And it's like he won again. And then all of a sudden, I realized that he wasn't just Bobby Allison's son trying to follow in his dad's footsteps. He was Davey Allison that was probably going to be a pretty good race car driver. Encouraged by that early success, Davey continued on his quest to become a Winston Cup driver. By April 1983, he earned his first super speedway pole and win in an ARCA race at Talladega. By the end of 1985, he'd proven himself on the ARCA circuit, becoming the series' all-time leader in super speedway poles and wins. In all, he'd win 45 short track features while waiting for his big break to happen. His first chance came in the Bush series in 1983. It was a 25th place finish, but he was there. 
Then in 84, Haas Ellington gave Davey a chance to prove himself at Talladega. Incredibly, he'd finish 10th. Two years later, he'd really turn heads as he took over Neil Bonnet's ride in Junior Johnson's car. Allison would start seventh, lead twice, and finish seventh, leaving a lasting impression on all who witnessed his run, including future car owner Robert Yates. And actually, Rusty had more experience, and uh, and the uh, he had a sponsor, Ayu Guard, I believe, and we talked to the sponsor people and it really wasn't enough money to do the program like uh, you know Harry and Ere wanted to do it and Harry said let's well, how about Davey you know I said well how about a sponsor you know because you don't it's tough racing without a sponsor and he said we'll get a sponsor I've got faith in you I said well it's awful tough but I remember that boy can drive a race car and certainly if after that he had driven Junior's car and, and Hall Sellington's car real well so I said well we'll do it that day, that phone call came and he got the ride with Harry Rainier and got to get in a car that was capable of winning. And he got in and went to Daytona the first year and qualified on the outside pole. It was the class of the field other than the problems that they had. I knew that Davey Allison was a winner. Unbelievably, in 1987, success seemed instant for Davey Allison as the Rainier Lundy race team sat on the front row for their Daytona debut, and then earned the pole at Rockingham just one week later, all with no sponsor. But those statistics quickly put the rookie in the headlines while Texaco soon jumped on board. JT Lundy um, bet me, wanted to bet me money that we wouldn't win a race, who was one of the owners, you know. David just had it, you know. Almost on the pole at Daytona, almost a Daytona win the first time out would have been too much for us. I think we would probably, I mean, I went away from there thinking they knew we were here. We didn't get so much confidence that we won't be any good, and uh, it just worked out pretty good for us. When you really thought about it, and then knowing what kind of race car he climbed into, which was the, the 28 car with Robert Yates engines, when you really thought about it, it, I guess it really didn't surprise you, but he did. I mean, he come along and sat on the front row the first race. The second race he won't run at Rockingham, he sat on the pole. And then, as you said, by the end of May, he was a two-time winner, and that was pretty impressive. But a rookie still has a rather steep learning curve, no matter how much instant success they have had. And Davey was no exception, as fast as he was on the pole in Daytona. At Darlington, a track notorious for giving drivers a lesson or two, his hopes for a first victory literally went up in flames as he and his father crashed at the track too tough to tame. I think we were running like fifth or sixth when he got in the corner too hard and crashed. and crashed a, a couple of other cars and his dad was involved in the accident. He came off the banking and at that time they had some old wood poles and a guardrail and he slid right through there and it tore the whole back of the gas tank out. Well, he's talking to me while he's spinning. He says, man, I'm crashing hard. And that's the last thing I ever hear. I look over there and I see this big loud, see this big, uh, ball of flame going up and hear this explosion and the spotter's going crazy so the car's burning up. So we take off running and the smoke is so bad I run right past Davey and the firemen are grabbing me and I'm all tore up and everything and he, he comes down there and grabs me you know and we, we hugging each other. It, it was an awful frightening experience. It was really the first major wreck that he had been in and you know it was almost welcome to the big time. It would only be a little over a month from that terrifying day that Davey would actually reach victory lane, becoming the first rookie since 1981 to do so. Fittingly, that celebration took place at home where so many of his past accomplishments had taken place, Talladega. But the victory would be bittersweet as 21 laps into the race, Bobby Allison would go for the ride of his life as he flipped through the trioval, frightening his home crowd and his son. It was a race that would epitomize the careers of both father and son. His dad, okay, 
Davey would take his first Winston Cup checkered flag at 26 years of age. Just totally incredible. Something that we had dreamed about for a long, long time, and to be 26 years old and to be sitting in a place like that, it just it was a dream come true. To get the first win, it was awesome. It, it probably didn't even sink in for a couple of days, but when we left there and went home that night, it was, it was 10 o'clock before I got home after going through all the post-race interviews and the race being delayed for two hours and 45 minutes. And driving all the way home is like, I, I kept having to force myself to drive the speed limit because I was wanting to hurry up and get back home and celebrate that win with my family and, and, and to be there with my parents because my dad was pretty excited in victory lane too. And he was a big part of the reason why I was there. His legendary first season continued as Davey sealed his Rookie of the Year title with another win at Dover, Delaware. The season began with what is now a classic Daytona 500 finish and perhaps the happiest day in Alabama gang history. And more importantly, Allison racing history as Bobby and Davey battled for the win in the season opening Daytona 500. It was a happy victory lane, but also testimony to the maturing youngster as he joined in his father's victory party. A moment many close to him saw as a turning point in Winston his Cup, Cup races and began to become one of the most popular drivers on the circuit. But in 1991, he reached new heights, mainly due to a change in personnel at what is now Robert Yates Racing as Larry McReynolds became crew chief and leader of the team. With a new team effort, the 28 car came together and became a contender consistently each and every week. When 1991 was over, Davey had led more races, 23, and more miles, over 1,800, than any other driver on the tour. He won six races, including the prestigious Winston. From the start, they didn't disappoint, as Davey avoided a 17-car crash and took control of the Daytona 500. I'm glad everybody gives me credit for being so smart and making all these tremendous moves. The only thing I did is I really didn't feel like they could make it through turn two, three abreast. You know, no matter who was there, didn't matter if it was Bill Sterling and Ernie or if it was Dale, Rusty, and Mark. I, I just don't think three cars were going to make it through their three abreast. So I backed off and waved off the car that was behind me. And when they tangled, I saw which way they were headed, and I just turned to miss them. And as I went by, the hole closed up behind me. The only other one that made it through right then was Morgan. And everybody else had to pick their way real carefully. Back to a subject we talked on earlier, learning curve of Davy Allison. I think at that juncture right there, sure, that, that halfway $10,000 lap was just a few laps away. And it was obvious that three or four of those top six was going to wreck or win that money. And I think Davey Allison smelled that happening because two laps prior to that, he'd come on the radio and said, I sure don't like what I see going on. But with the restrictor plates at Daytona, you can't really back off the gas, fall back a little bit and get back in line. If you do that, you'll end up at the tail end of the line. But he was smart enough to keep a close enough watch on them top two or three to know what was fixing to come down. And he cracked the throttle and turned the steering wheel just enough, I think, to avoid it where I think if it had been one Daytona 500 sooner, more than likely, probably, we'd have been right in the middle of it because we would have tried to win that $10,000 or wreck along with them. It would be the second time a father-son duo had won the Daytona 500 as Davey joined three-time winner Bobby in victory lane. But little did he know that the most challenging and tumultuous season of his career was about to begin. We stayed consistent. You know, we finished second at Rockingham in the second race, and then we had a streak of fourth place finishes, three races in a row, and uh, went to, to Bristol and crashed. You know, and we thought, man, this is really gonna set us back. Well, even though we crashed at Bristol, we didn't lose the point lead. And then we came back the following week at North Wilkesboro and won. Crashed at Martinsville, bruised the right lung, you know, and that was the second car that we had totaled in three weeks. Two of our best cars were gone. It was gonna, we knew it was gonna set us back a little bit, have to replace those two cars. 
but we felt like that the way things have been going, that we didn't, still didn't lose the point lead. We'd go back to the shop, build new cars to replace them, and that we'd be okay. And then we went on to Talladega and ended up in victory lane again. You know, it was like crash one week, win the next, crash the next week, win the next. It just seemed like we would be fast and wreck. You know, we would just, maybe we were, you know, David and I never really discussed this, but it's not like we were driving up on the edge um, and, and very unsafe. We were just, I mean, I could go back through all the incidents and there was a reason for each incident. In the middle of those ups and downs, Davey would lose one of the forces behind his ascent in NASCAR racing, his grandfather, affectionately known as Pop. A sore and beat up Allison would dedicate his win to Pop in an emotional victory lane. As May began, Davey dominated again at Talladega and found himself in the running for the Winston Million Dollar Bonus because of his win at Daytona coupled with the win at the Winston 500. A Charlotte victory would give him the bonus. His first challenge, however, would be a second consecutive win in the Winston All-Star event, where the events of the first third of the season came to a violent head. It all started, you know, about two laps prior to the finish. We had had a pretty good car that night. We had won the first segment and led every lap. We had sat on the pole and led all 30 laps. The second segment, by virtue of the invert process, and not quite being as good as we was the first segment, we ended up, I think, about fifth or sixth. And with 10 laps shootout, you know, I told Davey during the break, you know, if we can win this race, that's great, but we got a good race car. One of the most important races of the season is coming up next week. Let's just take what it'll give us and we'll go from there. And if that's winning it, that's fine, but don't get yourself in trouble. And he agreed with me. And it looked like with two to go, we was gonna finish third, and that was okay. We, we had won plenty of money that night with winning the first segment and sitting on the pole. But again, going back to the competitors of Davey Allison and really this entire team, it seemed like all of a sudden that last lap, we was catching up and then them boys got in trouble. And it would have been easy for Davey to have backed off and finished second. It would have been worth a lot of money to this race team. But I would not want to see the results no different. Just like Davey Allison said, if he had to do it all over again, he'd do it the same way. I knew that we were going to crash just as soon as the two cars touched the final time. And I knew that we were going to hit the outside wall, and I, I grabbed hold of the steering wheel as hard as I could but still a 175 mile an hour impact on the left side is, that's a pretty serious impact. And to, to be honest with you, I shouldn't have walked away from that. I shouldn't have been able to get out of that car with assistance from others, but, and be alert of what was going on and only have to spend the night in the hospital one night. That, that's a pretty serious impact. And I was pretty lucky that night. Well, I took off running. We had to end pit and I was the first one to the car. And I seen him in there all, laid over and I pulled the top off the fire extinguisher and was getting ready to pull it because the front of the car was on fire. Not real bad, but he was knocked out. I really thought I'd lost my buddy. But he had these old big veins in his neck and then all the things, he's just pumping and everything and the rescue squad comes over and I said, you know, he's alive. I'm sure he's busted up pretty bad. So. We ended up cutting the roof and all that off and went and stayed in the hospital with him. And, uh, he was at the racetrack on Wednesday, ready to go. That crash didn't stop the Allison Express as they'd be consistent through June, even dominant at times as they won Michigan for win number five. As the healing process continued, Somehow, Davey maintained the points lead in his quest for his first ever Winston Cup title. Competitions, and we had our fights. Uh, I don't think anything was, was out of the ordinary, but uh, he had uh, things that he liked to do, and I had my things. As the final third of the season continued, a battered Davey Allison headed to Michigan, a place he had dominated in past runs. While he was en route to the race, 
brother Clifford was practicing for his qualifying run in a Bush Grand National event at the Speedway when tragedy struck. Clifford would not survive his accident. An emotionally stunned Allison arrived at the track trying to erase the pain and move on towards his own championship dreams. But there was nothing he could do but remember his brother. Despite his grief, Davy climbed into his race car on Sunday, seeking comfort the only way a stock car driver knows how, racing. If you sit back and look at all the negative things and all the things that have gone wrong, you can drag yourself down. And I've never had the, the type of personality to do that. I, I've always been the kind of person that look at the bright side of everything and, and try to make something positive out of even the worst situations. And, you know, Clifford's death, it hit close to home and it hit awful hard. But the thing about it was he wasn't working at a job that he didn't like. He was doing what he enjoyed. And we all know what the dangers are and what the risks are before we ever fasten the seat belts and the shoulder harnesses. And that part of it makes me happy that I know that he might have died, but he died happy. Another competitor might have thrown up their hands in frustration and given up entirely, but not Davey. He moved on, taking each challenge as it came, even finishing fifth at Michigan that trying weekend, displaying a trait that runs deep in the Allison veins, an inner strength handed down through each generation. Davy's determination was his real strength. You know, just a, a setback was only a temporary setback to him. You know, just came right back. And, uh, you know, we saw him in a lot of races where he'd have some early problem and, and uh, fall way behind, and he just would never give up. The rest of the 1992 season continued to be turbulent, including his last chance at the Winston Million Dollar Bonus at Darlington. After leading 72 laps, he was in an excellent position to earn the win and the cash until a rain shower shortened the race after he pitted for fuel. He'd finish fifth. Davey wouldn't win again until Phoenix in November, where he regained the points lead over second place Alan Kowicki by a slim 30. Despite the pressure, Davey continued to smile. We hadn't won since June in Michigan. And even we hadn't had very strong performances. And we'd been through so much besides the injuries, besides the tore up cars. We go into Darlington with a chance to win a million dollars, have a car that's strong enough to do it, and the rain bites us. So the rain helped us in July, but it bit us hard in, in September. But then we finally, it's like Phoenix was finally that turning block that finally said, okay, I think Davy's recovered and everything's back on track. We got our cars back where we need to have them. We're okay now. And we approached Atlanta with the same attitude that we had approached every race. I mean, we didn't take it no different. We felt fortunate to be in that situation. And if it was God's will, we'd win it. If it wasn't, then we just would get ready to try to win the 93 championship. As Atlanta approached, the tension mounted. Davey would have to finish sixth or better to become Winston Cup champion. Running sixth with less than 100 laps to go, Davey was caught in an accident when Ernie Irvin blew a tire, thus gashing his title dreams. As he waved to the crowd and thanks, Allison handled the situation like a champion. We didn't get it, so we'll just go back and we'll get ready for next year and we'll come out and try again. It just wasn't meant to be. You know, that's the type of attitude and outlook, outlook he exemplified in everything he did. And you know, after we wrecked, and it would have been easy for us to have packed our stuff up, throwed it in the truck, and said to heck with it. When we put that car back out there, I didn't go back to the pits. I went and stood on top of the trailer. And those last 50 laps, watching that car ride around there with no front end and no side, it just kind of, I kind of reflected. I said, you know, this is kind of how our whole year has went. But at least we're going out and fighting and scrapping till the last checker flag of the last race. And again, I think it made a big statement about Davey and our entire race team about, you know, that we just don't give up. No matter what you throw at us, we're going to keep clawing back. 
by the Richmond race weekend, they already had tallied a victory and just about seemed ready to hit their stride as July began. Tragically, it would come to a sudden end on July 13th when the helicopter Davy was piloting crashed, ironically, at the place where he was most successful, Talladega Super Speedway, leaving his loved ones only with their cherished memories. I knew Davy had a strong fan following. That day in July when those people lined the streets and lined the interstate and the cards, the letters, the phone calls, I had no idea the impact that he had put on people's lives. He had that mischievous uh, deal, you know, if he knew somebody was jumpy, he'd walk up and goose them and, you know, or throw something at them or, or somebody that was afraid of a bug, you know, he'd, he'd throw that kind of a bug at them. That never did leave him. He was that way right up till, till the very end. It didn't matter what Davey did, he did it with 100%. Whether it was driving a race car, whether it was trying to plot to come around and goose me, or whether it was sitting down eating dinner, he always did it with full concentration, determination, and full effort. He knew what he wanted to do, and he did it. All the doors weren't open for Davy Allison because of his father's. He knocked a lot of them down. The entire time I worked with Davy, and never had a doubt from him, never had a, an argument. The best memory I've got with Davy Allison, we never had an argument. Well, I'm proud of him for a lot of things, but I think I'm most proud of him for just being the, the gentleman that he was. If I could be remembered as a friendly person and a person who took time out for others around him, that would be more than enough to satisfy me.